welcome to Varm Blog. And for those who know the format, know when I play the less aggressive intro, we're talking about art. And today I'm here with Colin Dodd. Hello. Um, <clears throat> hi. Um, Colin is a writer. I worked with him when I did a literary journal called Formal People for several years. He was a semi-regular contributor. He has a couple of books to his name. Uh, Windfalls, one I'm familiar with, and your book of poetry, Spokes of an Uneven Wheel. Uh, like a lot of people who write, though, you do a lot to, to put together a living. So would you like to talk about all the things that you do? I know. <clears throat> I feel like whenever I'm, I'm, I'm asked questions after I tell people I'm a writer, it's always, how do I make a living? <laughs> um, and so I have made a living. In a way, I've been fortunate um, because I've always made it through some form of writing. And that form of writing has been, I've written mutual fund analyses. I've been a journalist. Uh, I've been a copywriter. I've written uh, scripts for commercials. Um, I've, I've, I've written just about everything you can imagine. I've written social posts for, for banks and um, you name it. So I, in a way, I've been very lucky. And in a way, maybe not. It's hard to say, you know, because it, it, it does, I feel like it starts to seep into my creative groundwater in a way that's suspect at times but in another way it's been really good because it's given me a view of the world that i never ever would have sought out on my own so yeah i think i want to talk about that because you're one of the writers that i talk to like myself um like my friend john penton who chose not to go into academia i mean i love mm. academia um which is kind of the way we do patronage now i mean if we're honest that's kind of what's going on there um it's not you know, very good patronage no it's not <laughs> um i won't go too into it because a lot of my colleagues may get mad at me but a couple years ago um, i went back to my old mfa and i noticed how many of the of my former professors and colleagues were just super depressed <laughs> and so i was oh, like sure yeah. yeah i'm glad i jumped that bullet well but, it's, I, th I think it's hard not to get depressed no matter what you do. You know, it's, uh, you know, you get it from this side because you're, you're trapped in a dead end adjunct job. You get it from this side because you're working, you know, for things that you despise. Um, you know, one way or another, you're going to get depressed. So I think that's, that's interesting of what we ask of writers now because it's mm. a, a market that is, in some ways, having a headache because the ease of producing things, but in, in other ways, it's it's made it harder to make a living. Um, sure, sure. I grapple with the I, I grapple with this a lot, and you know, the question is always, you know, how come you know, how come you you weren't able to buy a boat with that last novel or something like that? And I think really what it was was our understanding of what it is to be a writer or an artist was very badly skewed by the middle of the 20th century, mm -hmm. where especially with literature, you had people coming from the G GI Bill. Um, for the first time, you had a mass audience of readers. There was a lionization of literacy and intelligence in the culture um, that has since been eroded by the free market, by mass media, um, you know, by the MTV generation, you know, where the, the librarian is the one who you spit your gum in the face of or something like that. And it, you know, all that stuff seemed like playful teenage hijinks, but it had a very real effect. And there was, in a way, a very powerful ideology behind it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that irreverence, it was, it was fun, but there was also, maybe it didn't start out as an ideology, but it became one. And it became one that really eroded the respect that people had for things like books. And I grew up in a place, I grew up in Massachusetts, um, which was a place where even if people weren't, even if they couldn't comprehend something like James Joyce's Ulysses, they knew it was something to aspire to. They knew it was something that they wanted to have something to do with. And there was a, a, a distant respect. And I mm -hmm. feel like that distant respect is gone. And I feel like that's had something to do with the market for books as a whole. Yeah. It, I feel like, I, you know, I'm 42 and I feel like I came in at the end of that that time period where we had the mm. glut of mass market paperbacks right so yeah. i guess i am part of the mtv generation um oh, I'm there 45 was, i'm the yeah no i'm saying yeah, so we're, yeah. we're we're both sort of in that that wheelhouse um yeah. one of the things that i 
think about a lot when I when I teach literacy now, and I, you know that's my that's my day job. Um, okay. Um, so what age group? Uh, I teach seniors mostly, but okay. I can go. I've taught as young as like sixth grade, and I've taught. Mm. I, I I was a I was an academic for a while, and I hated it. Um, sure. Uh, I, well, I have hats off to you. You're in the trenches. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I literally left being a professor with the idea that I'd rather go back to working at Lowe's. Mm. So, um, sure. the, so that was, that's in what, what I found interesting about that is, is I think you're right that in the eighties we had the explosion of the mass market paperbacks and the collapse of that market, like, mm in the course of a decade and a half. Right. Yeah. Um, and since then, it's been hard to say where literature is going. I was optimistic about the internet at first because it was a text-based medium. And while the pieces were short, it sure. was, we were pushing out a lot of literature and now I I, a lot I'm, of people were. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now with stuff like TikTok, I'm actually like, yeah, we might, we might be in a post-literate generation and like one I, or two of them. I, I sometimes feel like we're going to look back at, at these decades of the internet and say it was largely a gigantic and terrible dead end um, in terms of, because it's not delivering the goods, you mm -hmm. know, civilization, it, it, it takes a tremendous cost from us and it has to deliver the goods and it's not making us happy. It's not making us smart and it's not giving us hope. You know, you go back to the people who 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 look up to something like James Joyce's Ulysses, even if they can't necessarily read it. They had hope. They said there were smart people out there. They said there are people who are uh, credibly working on a better world. You know, and I don't know if that's really believable now. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it has a lot to do with the with the with the marketization of the Internet, which is mm -hmm. in like because when I think about. The early Internet and I was of age even though i didn't have a computer as a kid i had one in my in, by the time i was in college and i had access to them in high school mm. um because we had them in the library and you just go and use them um that internet did not it was full of all the crazy sick stuff that we're full of now but sure it was interesting is that wasn't organically aggregated. There was no algorithm trying to figure out how to keep you rage engaged. So uh, the rage engagement, I think, is fairly new. I feel like that's something we, we've only started to figure out and really hone to, you know, real perfection in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, you know, all, the problem with the Internet has never been the weird stuff. I think it's the flattening effect. It's the normalizing effect. It's the idea that there is a... Um, a crowd of, you know, there's this mainstream crowd that's always waiting for you. Should you ever step out of line and say something? Yeah, it, it is interesting because on one hand, I hear a lot of people lamenting the death of a monoculture. And yet I kind of feel like we actually have more of a monoculture now. It's just not watching Seinfeld at the same time. It's, yeah. it's being on Twitter and it's a modern culture that's worldwide but not in Eng but all in English. So it's very strange. I know. I know. Well, it's a, it's a monoculture that somehow precludes a subculture. So the thing about a monoculture was you had a subculture mm -hmm. and you had all weeklies, you had, you know, small record labels, you had places where people who didn't fit in could hide and find each other. And that doesn't exist in a digital environment because as soon as anybody thinks they have it, it gets called up into the light and then, you know, Twitter mobs and, and the outrage media gets on it. And it I don't know, it either becomes cool or it becomes destroyed. I keep opening and closing the door because my cat keeps scratching. I, so, I yeah. understand. Um, I think but you're I'm, right about that. Yeah, I feel like there's something about digital media that's really un, uh, not congenial to a, a subculture or a counterculture. And I feel like there's something about countercultures. They, they just seem to get... Um, co-opted or subsumed very rapidly um you know w w almost to the degree that they can't form a legitimately unique separate point of view i think you even see i mean i've been thinking about that in film i was complaining about the homogenization of film when oh, when it really started pushing to world markets mm. um uh, about 15 years ago in the middle of the aughts really is when that really began when you needed to like make enough money 
uh, to recoup, not just what you recoup in the United States, but recoup it in China. So the stakes have to go up, but the context has to go down. Yep. Um, yep. And it's, um, it also comes at the cost, not just of American mid-tier movies. It also comes at the cost of foreign movies. I lived abroad for 10 years and, well, eight and a half years. And Ooh. where did you live abroad? Uh, South Korea, Mexico, and Egypt. Oh, nice. And all those places pretty much lost their film industry uh, mm, in, that time, in that time period. Um, Korea's kind of been able to maintain one, but it's play, it's deliberately playing now to an American audience to mm. stay around. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mexico's film industry has been, it's either moved to television or it's been decimated. Like you, I went to cinemas in Mexico all the time and it was American movies, just, you know, subtitled yeah. in Spanish. Um, and I find that kind of interesting because it's gotten cheaper ostensibly to make movies. Yep. It's gotten cheaper to make everything. And, you know, you can make a movie on your iPhone, but where's the great iPhone movie? It's kind of, I, uh, I, I don't have the answer for why that hasn't happened. Um, but I think it has something to do with this stifling digital um, culture engine that we have going on right now. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think that's interesting because to bring it back to the topic of what we're actually talking about, the novels and literature. Yeah. Um, so I quit doing, doing former people, you know, in the pandemic because um, it became a little much uh, okay. with my other political commentary. For those of you who don't know, this is for my audience. I know you know Colin, but Foreign People was a literary journal. I started in like 2013 and ran until 2021. Mm. Um, and it was a place for me to interview famous authors and then sneak completely obscure or independent authors into the side pages. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you what what killed it. We we kept it alive for about six years, but the moment Facebook uh, changed its algorithm to give pay to pay preference, mm. um, everything but the interviews um, dropped readership significantly mm. overnight. Like, like overnight, because sharing it just didn't matter. Yeah. And Twitter, where things are not as hampered, is ha, is for a variety of reasons. And I think it has to do with the subcultural thing that we're talking about. Political subcultures thrive on there. But like artistic ones, there are exceptions to this. But in general, I found that they don't. Like, mm. like you know, I'll, I'll go to a well-established journal's literary page. And unless they're like the Paris Review, they don't have that many followers even when they do they're not sharing the work mm. and and it's because i think a good novel even a mediocre novel honestly is going to be too complicated to be reduced down to something that you could do an outrage tweet about yeah um yeah. and unless it's about a priorly established author and then it's not going to be about the work it's going to be about how much we're annoyed by david foster wallace fans or whatever yeah like, yeah and the fact is that attention is ultimately even if you're dealing on a scale of a nation or a planet it's still a finite uh it's still finite and so all the time you spend getting angry all the time you spend saying i can't believe this person has a thousand followers or a million followers or whatever all that takes away from attention you could spend elsewhere. And the problem with attention is that it is, um, it's not loyal. It's not reliable. It's not loyal to your intentions. Your attention goes where it goes. Your attention is, uh, it's not always the best part of you. And it's, it's not always something that you can control as anyone who's been in a car accident can tell you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, or been in any kind of, stressful recovery situation from an accident um yeah, even if it's yeah. not car um so um i say as a person almost blew his face off uh trying to light a pilot light in a on a Oof. Uh, on a water heater in mexico so like, oh my goodness been there <laughs> um yeah uh, so it's you know, your book Ferrani is interesting to me because there's a it, there's a bunch of ideas that overlap with ideas I'm interested in. One of the one of the things I think it's I don't know, like I know some of your work because I've mm. published some of your work, yeah, but yeah. but uh, it, 
I found this this interesting because it was kind of explicitly a genre novel, but it's a genre novel that's hard to clearly place in one genre. Um, I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, which is harder to do. I mean, one of the one of the interesting things that I've been doing on my own is studying the development of genres as marketing categories in the 20th century and like yep. what that did, you know, the move from weird fiction to horror, science fiction and fantasy and then subcategories of fantasy and then subcategories of horror. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is science fiction with no subcategory. So I have a little bit of leeway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um but there are some there are some genres that are extremely prescriptive, and you have to use the phrase again. You have to deliver the goods in a very defined way, or else the readers really go after you. Yeah, I think science fiction and and weird fiction are the two giant weird fictions in the title. It's it's almost impossible even to find what it is. Yeah, and it it was I think it was resurrected because we were exhausting subgenres and yeah yeah and this that and the other. Um, Science fiction is still pretty wide open. Um, luckily, I think so. yeah, yeah. I I think the seventies like new new wave of science fiction really did a good job of blowing that door open to a lot of different kinds of writing. Yeah, thank um, you again, Philip K. Dick. Right, exactly. You know, from Philip K. Dick to J.G. Ballard. Um, and the other thing I've noticed, and I maybe want your commentary on this because. You know, you work in a lot of different literary genres, right? Mm, yeah. Um, in the even in the early days when I was in the MFA twenty years ago, if you were an MFA writer and you didn't go to like BYU, which specializes in high fantasy for some reason that I don't understand, mm, or Clarion, mm. uh, the moment you wrote genre writing, like you were pretty much out of that world, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I know. It was all the um, yeah. It was, it was all very realistic. It's about middle class people getting depressed and driving in cars and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's driving in cars and having affairs. Yeah, the 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 the, the John Updike school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of those books are great. I mean, I'm not going to knock it, but um, yeah. So, but but your point was that you were kind of excluded from literary fiction if you had any sort of fantastic elements at all in your work. Yeah, or you could have one, but you'd have to like you'd have to do what Margaret Atwood insisted on doing for twenty years, which is to claim you weren't writing genre fiction; it was speculative fiction, mm. somehow separate. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think I, I was going to ask you, um, as a person who's written in a lot of these different genres now, yeah. Um, do you think those divisions? have fallen away i've noticed a lot of people now use their real name like or one name when they publish in different genres and the way authors used to handle this which is to create a completely different persona sure yeah for when they yeah. wrote in a different genre um <clears throat> i think if i had to guess i would say it's that as the level of interest in the work has receded it's become less important to satisfy the conditions of different genres you know, you're a writer. These are your books. Um, but that said, it's, it, it is confusing. And, and I don't think it's, you know, whatever I have as a career, it hasn't helped my career to write in so many different genres. <laughs> um, you know, but the fact of the matter is people don't most. I mean, Jesus Christ, most people don't care at all. Never mind care on that level where they say, oh, what genre do you write in? And how dare you write outside that genre? I wish I had that level of interest in my work, but I don't. Um so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't experience that as a big issue when I approach a work. What, I mean, the thing is, is it interesting enough for me to write a whole book and then rewrite it two to five more times? Like, is, is it interesting enough to me to survive through the writing of the book? Um, because I, you know, I often fear, you know, as a writer, I'm not going to survive a book that doesn't get finished. So that's, you know, that for me is the main question. The question of what genre, I mean, that's for the marketing people. That's not for the writer, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, um, it's interesting. I think I, I, I don't have the burden of ever considering this because A, I'm a poet, and B, the, other, the only prose I write is explicitly nonfiction. So it's yeah. not something I, I think about. I used to write short stories. Um, but the reason why I quit doing that um, is just uh, I 
I have a poetic eye, which would be good in short stories, but it tends to drive me up the wall and I can't finish them. Mm. Um, and I know and, what you mean. Yeah. Um, and like, I remember people telling me about Proust and people like, shell, you know, throwing a whole novel away. And I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't normally like privilege arguments, but I'm going to make one on this because uh, I don't have time or the privilege to work on a book for a year and throw it away. <laughs> like, like I need to know pretty quickly if the time I'm investing into this, since it's above and beyond all the other work and writing I do, yeah, yeah. Um, that yeah. it's going to produce something at least I'm going to like. No, um, I would just say, no, I think it would be... Um... It, it, it's not necessarily, <clears throat> I mean, there's a cost. There's mm -hmm. a giant cost to creating a book in terms of time and everything else. I have two children. I live in New York City. Everything is so goddamn expensive. It's unbelievable. Um, and that's there, you know, the, the idea of my, you know, my time has value, my time. But it's, it's, it's less to do with that than the fact that when I don't finish a book, I feel like it, it'll represent a lot. I'll lose faith in myself and my and in my ability to take on another project. So it's 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 more of a personal economy than it has to do with my time, because I I write novels and I will continue to write novels most likely. I write books. I write really weird books. I write books of aphorisms. You want to go to Amazon and show me the top selling <laughs> aphorism book? Trust me, it's not making a lot of money. Um, and you know, and I and I do experiments with film and software and there's no guarantee guarantee there's no even strong hint that these will ever make a dollar um but i do them and i see them through to completion and i think if i'm not doing that if i'm failing to do that then that's going to create a crisis personally mm -hmm. um but as far as i'm concerned this is you know this is why i'm on the planet is to do this stuff and so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it no matter what I have to do to make a living, no matter what I have to do to keep my, my wife and kids happy. Um, I'm not a corporation. I can't think of myself in terms of fiscal quarters um, because I'll die. I'll die. I, you know, um, you talk about people being depressed. It's because you only see things in, in light of this time is money perspective. And that's, uh, I think totally false. I think that that's, you know, you're trapped inside of a bad idea. Yeah. Well, I was liberated by, from that by choosing poetry because there's absolutely no money in it. Um, right? Yeah, no hope. No hope. I, God, what was I reading? I was reading this. Oh, I was reading a book of aphorisms by a Frenchman from uh, 300 years ago. And he said, you know, um, he, he said Dante's phrase, abandon all, all hope, ye who enter here should actually be written above paradise instead of, you know, hell. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, I mean, right. The, I mean, the I mean, the guy did this in what? 12 words. Very powerful. As a very elaborate joke. Um, I put that over my door uh, when I was a high school teacher a few years ago. Oh, and I love it. Nobody, since I put it in Italian, nobody actually checked to see what it said. So <laughs> they never asked me to take it down. Oh, I love um, it. <laughs> um, they probably thought it meant like reading is fundamental. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's a certain amount of, I, I think one of the interesting thing about art as a process versus art as a commodity, right? Is mm. like, um, you know, yeah, all of us want, our, our art to be to to have readers and that does actually require us to interface with the market and it does actually require us to treat it in some ways as a commodity mm. but if i created that way i like you probably wouldn't create anything because it, it wouldn't seem worth it to me i have uh, tried it i have tried it i've written sitcom pilots and by the time i'm on page whatever it is 22 i'm i'm like ready to jump out a window yeah, I, I I also tried my hand at writing at writing screenplays for that reason. It's like, oh, that's where you can make money. And I was like, right, I, you, I, I can't do it. <laughs> it's it's like somewhere you feel like there's a sweet spot where it's what you want to do and it's what the world wants, and somehow you can you can hit that sweet spot and everything will clarify in your life. And um, and it just uh, I, I've had a hard time finding that sweet spot. Yeah, I think. 
it's one of those things where where I, I tell kids this actually that like if you don't do the work, you can't get lucky, but it is luck. <laughs> like, oh, it's, yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, we'll just go turn on the, the TV or the iPad. I mean, it's not you're not watching the best ideas out there. You're watching luck at play. Yep. Uh, yeah. And yeah, and I also think about you know, if I was say someone like I don't know Jeff Vandermeer, and they make my my book into a movie, and then, then my book becomes huge, like the Southern Reach trilogy did. Um, I also think about the the kind of control you lose with that, mm. um, and in some ways, I would find that interesting. But you know, just as a person who used to do in college, I did a little bit of theater, and I was always interested in like writers letting go of their control of a piece but in another sense i would probably not recognize like i, I get why authors get snarky about film versions and whatnot because it's almost mm -hmm. never going to be um what you had in your head as you were writing it yeah um so to get into the ferona a little bit you do you want to give us the the briefs synopsis of the setup because i want to talk about some of the ideas in it sure which i absolutely. find fascinating but you know i yeah. don't want to give spoil the book but they do kind of people do kind of have to know a little bit before oh no absolutely yeah i know it's a it's a balancing act so for <clears throat> ferroni is about a guy who comes back from the dead he was uh he was a wild man at the center of a group of friends he, he comes back from the dead and interrupts their, you know, the, the uh, memorial drinks they're having for him. And <clears throat> he interacts with them for a little while and then he goes away. One of the friends, the narrator, um, starts a religion half by accident. Um, another one founds a technology empire built on digital pain or digital empathy. Um, another one is an artist who struggles and continues to struggle throughout the book. Another one is a secret revolutionary working in an insurance company. And over time, the religion and the technology empire attract very powerful financial backers who sort of put them in a position where they have to come into conflict with one another. The conflict, I'm not going to give away the ending, um, is, is rather extreme. And the consequences of it uh, change technology for the entire world and they change what it means to be a human being in a small way. Yeah. And so what I found interesting about this is it's a very um, embodied concept deals with, the, I mean, the way you write is very, it, it, it is, it, the people feel real in it because, mm. you know, I haven't, I will admit to my audience, I haven't finished the book yet because we worked this out pretty quickly, but yeah. Um, no um, I was also interested in how high concept it was, despite being that embodied. Yeah. Um, and I was reading this piece you did for modern literature where you explain some of the backstory of how you arrived at writing this book, why it came out during COVID in particular, that you, you know, you were able to finish some ideas that have been kind of percolating back there. Some of them sounds like they've been percolating about there for like 20 years. A long time. Some of them, yeah. I just hadn't been able to find a home for them. Yeah. Um, when you one of the things that you mentioned in that article, um that many boring and pointless jobs uh are kind of a gift to keep us from doing things that are self-destructive. Um, which is interesting because it's kind of a positive spin on what like you know, someone like David Graeber who would write about this, I think. Oh, yeah, the 12. bullshit jobs. I'm a, yeah. I'm a giant David Graeber fan. Yeah. 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 And it, it's interesting to me because I, I think you're also kind of, you know, as a person who's gone on like a retreat and sat in a, in a room for a week and just had to sit there. Um, there is few things on earth that can break your mind <laughs> faster <laughs> than just being still with nothing to do for more than 48 hours. Oh like, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, hats off to you for doing that. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and no, but, I mean, free time, it'll not just break your mind. It'll, it'll make you do things that 
are completely self-destructive. You know, oh yeah, free time. Free time is not the friend you thought it was. Um. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that because I find myself when I do have free times. I'm like I said, I'm a teacher, mm. and. Uh, you know what I do during the summer? I either travel or I start creating podcasts and writing a bunch of and taking on a bunch of writing projects. And then like basically whatever I was going, whatever time I would have been spending teaching, I now just take an additional work to fill yep. um, for no for little to no pay. So it's not even about money. It's just about keeping yourself busy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no, I feel like, um, you know, you work very hard when you work very hard. The thought is, well, in the time that you're not working. You need to not work at all. You need to completely uh, de-stress. And, and that sounds really good. That seems to make sense. Like you have this finite amount of energy and you've used it all up and now just relax and don't use it. But actually what happens is all the time you spent working, it's not just work. It's not just the time and the energy. It's the mental energy. It kind of, it, it shapes your, your personality and your brain into something that you might, you might not really like. So the answer is not really to stop working. The answer is more work, Yeah, you know, and as a writer, I go back to the Ray Bradbury line, which is that, you know, real serious writers, they write in order to not be destroyed by the world. And um, it's because the world is always hard at work destroying you. And that's also true when you're working very hard for it. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I think I have a very similar philosophy where I, I I'm always like that for me, the problem of work is not, labor because i think i would probably be doing labor no matter what i did mm. um the problem that i have with work is autonomy but even then there are times you know there are going to be no society on earth where there's not some things i have to do that i don't want to do I um i know and, you yeah. know so even my utopia still has like i still have to like clean the cat box when i have cats or even uh, howard hughes had to talk to somebody through the keyhole yeah right. well you want to talk about somebody who where, where free time was utterly destructive, like yeah, 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 yeah seriously. Um, so yeah, th there's a, there's another concept that I kind of wanted to pick up on. We can talk about how they both kind of interplay in the book without giving too much of the plot, but sure. Uh, this idea of digital pain and digital empathy is really crucial to the book. I mean, that there's, mm. um, and I found that, um. I found that interesting because I, yeah, I'm actually doing research right now on parasociality and its effect on politics and, and how, you know, yes, Virginia, it's a bigger problem with the internet, but no, it's not new. It's actually very old. It's not, you know, the internet didn't invent parasocial relations. Um, I'm not sure if I know what you mean by parasocial relations. Parasocial relations. relations yeah. Okay. So that's this idea that, um, well, it's, it's this way that humans will treat the abstract representation of humans as something mm. they actually have a relationship with. And they will begin oh. to empathize with figures they see on TV or with fandoms or even with abstract ideas, if they're humanized enough. Mm. Um, and you will have stuff like parasocial breakups and stuff like that. Mm. It was studied a lot in the fifties and the beginnings of celebrity culture and television. And it was kind of oh, like, interesting it kind of became only studied by marketers for a long time. And then yeah. social media happened <laughs> and people were like, yeah, cause you have this way in which as a person, you know, now the, the, and with social media, it's almost semi parasocial cause there is some relationship, but it's really asymmetrical. So like, yeah. like, like if you're, if you're even like a streamer who has, let's say a thousand people in your audience, which is tiny, yeah. For, for the internet um you have you, you know you might have bits of investment with a few regulars but you have you can't have a very strong investment with your audience there's no sure. way there's just no not enough hours in the day yeah right um and in most traditional art mediums you know, except for theater um there's there's a media there's something mediating that yeah. more um but with the internet that mediation breaks down um and so Especially you can have like, people get mad at you. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, Twitter dynamics, public breakups, breakups with franchises, toxic fandoms, all kind of wrap up yeah. in this idea. 
But what's interesting is it actually is in a way related to this idea of digital empathy because what's driving this is the need to empathize. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and it can, it can, like, you can register that in some level as betrayal, you know, yeah, or absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, and so when I was, I, I was, re I've been researching that. And when I saw in your novel, this idea was really crucial. I was like, oh, that's related. Um, yeah. Um, but I have been thinking a lot about like shared pain, digital pain, shared trauma, the digitization mm. of trauma. I remember, for example, uh, starting in about 2014, 2015, when there'd be mass shooting events anywhere in the world. And I was, I think, you know, I, I was either in Mexico or Egypt for some of the stuff. Mm. And we were talking about France and people are identifying with things that happen that far away as if or at least and some people it's probably sincere some people's probably performative it's hard to say sure yeah it's a chance to talk about themselves yeah right but yeah. but there is an identification with these events and tragedies in places well, that are far away but it's I also so. superficial it's superficial but i think that's also there's uh, an urgency on the part of, uh, unfortunately, on, on, on the part of the news media to serve up the most awful things because they mm -hmm. know they have to be completely atrocious and completely relatable in order for you to internalize them. Um, now, in the book itself, the idea was, now, I don't know if you've ever been around somebody when they break their leg or when they snap their Achilles tendon or when they shatter a collarbone. Mm -hmm. But there is something that happens to you, and it's not in the frontal part of your brain, but there is something physical that happens to you uh, in terms of empathy. And it is, it's a physical response. Um, and so the idea was that somebody had created a video game where if you shot somebody, you would experience that kind of empathetic um, sensation mm -hmm. in your body just from a couple lines of code. And... The idea was it made the video game very engrossing and very like it, compelling. Um, but ultimately, the big money figured out that this would be a tremendous way to get people to buy Pepsi, you know, because they could show Coke and then make you feel like you just watch somebody be run over by a by a car or, or something like that. And mm -hmm. I think one reason why this, uh, you know, as, as I kind of worked on it, one reason it was relevant was every day we log on to our computers we swipe open our phones and a lot of what we experience is pain is 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 some version of empathetic pain and there's even it's there's even a masochistic tend tendency to go and look for the worst of it and sometimes it happens and i don't know why but it's kind of a mass conditioning to to have you seek out the pain or to not respond to anything but the pain. I mean, the thing is, if you find something that makes you feel angry or that makes you feel that empathetic um, sensation of discomfort, it wipes out the actual information that you're going looking for. I think a lot of people have had the experience of going, taking their phone, saying, is it going to rain today? Mm -hmm. And never finding out because of everything else that comes up. And then ultimately having a head full of things that you never really were looking for in the first place that don't necessarily help you. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting also that you, you know, in this essay that you sent me, you were talking about how that occurred to you around 2014. And I'm like, well, funnily enough, we now know that that's when Facebook started experimenting to see what messing with that would do. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think that was, I think that was something they were doing, messing with algorithms to see what encouraged engagement and what most of what encouraged engagement was basically negative responses yep. so angry people click right yep and i found that you know and, and in a way yes we kind of known this since the beginning of tv news we've known it's it reads it leads but the scale yep. of that and the able to fine-tune the manipulation of that oh my goodness yeah you know and to find the things that you empathize with and will piss you off or upset you or make you afraid I don't watch a lot of proper television, television, but you go to cable news and that's all it is. It's one thing after another. It's outrage after outrage. And if they run out of outrage, they just go back and repeat the old outrage. And there's no, uh, there's not a lot of information there. No, I mean, it's, yeah. it, 
on one hand, it's true in America that like the period where we didn't have a partisan press was actually a weird period. In the same time period we're talking about with books, it's actually like from the fifties into the early nineteen eighties. Well, and that's... I, I'm I'm gonna I, I disagree. I think what you had was you you did have a partisan press. It was just um it it, it was in print, and it came out ah, once yeah. a day. Yeah, I mean. You know, you think about New York, you think about Boston, they always had like, you know, a paper on the left and a paper on the right. It's not, it's, it, you know, um, what you did have was you had the FCC regulating three channels, right. um, regulating them and saying, we're going to pull your license if if anything happens that we tend not to like. Um, which, which is also not a norm I necessarily want to go back to, but yeah. it did lead to this kind of, I guess when we're talking about digital flattening, it was a different flattening. It was it was kind of a milk toast flattening as opposed to an outright flattening, but it was a flattening nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. We've always had a partisan. We've always had a partisan press, but I will say, like reading partisan papers from say the twenties, which I've now gone and done, oh, and yes, great. it's full of of yellow journalism and sensationalism. Oh, but and, the writing back then, right? The prose. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. The, the, the prose is good. Oh, so good. Uh, um, and you're engaged and you would get information from it. Mm. Um, because while yes, the, the, the prose is heavily manipulated and sensationalized, um, it what like in any of those things, I, I can actually train people to go back and find even in some of the worst papers, unless they're outright lying, which occasionally mm. did happen. Sure. Um, uh, you can get good information out of that. I have done the same thing with cable news when I used to teach a media literacy class to high school students, um, which we don't teach anymore because it would be too controversial. Yeah, it doesn't fit in STEAM. Yeah. In STEM. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I and I would teach them things like the direction in which the – it's as subtle as whether or not they have you facing left and right. Mm. when they frame you in a picture and how how the audience is going to receive you. And I can go in and point to, like, you just oh, go on the Fox News and you will see Democrats are pointed leftward. And the same is true in MSNBC reverse that for Republicans. Ah. They, like, this is down to a precise art sure. um, of manipulating empathy, manipulating uh, adverse responses, manipulating all this kind of limbic brain, reptile brain stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but I think if 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 your if if your sole source of information um, is are, are these networks, you're not a very critical person to begin with. That's true. And, and, and so, like, like where do you begin a conversation? I mean, well, what is interesting about that is I'm always torn because on one hand, I know, for example, the average podcast has probably more people listening to it, even if it's mid tier, than say three in the morning on CNN or Fox news or whatever. Okay. Um, uh, on the other hand, somehow these things still have a pretty big hold on our culture, even though if you like look and you can even tell from the commercials, the only people watching them are like over 55 in any yeah. significant number. Um, well, they're the ones who vote. Right. Well, yes, yeah, there's a variety of reasons for that, but yes. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting to look at it in that, that scenario. Right. But I do think, this this idea that you're playing with of digital pain and it being manipulated and it being fundamental to marketing is something that like it's only one or two steps removed from what already is happening. No, no, exactly. And that's why this guy who just wants to make his video game better ends up sitting on billions of dollars and um, <clears throat> and it can be used for, you know, you, you can ma manipulate anybody that way. If you can make them feel pain when they go to look up the weather. I mean, my goodness, but it's not that far away, um, especially because one thing that I think we saw, especially during the pandemic, was the more time people spend online, the, the less the rest of the world starts to matter. You know, mm. people can be destroyed on Twitter because they're on Twitter all the time. It outweighs the input they're getting from the rest of their lives. And, you know, I, I, I think that's a danger. I, think that's I a realize danger. that. Yeah. During, I was an avid Facebook user for about 10 years. And it was largely originally because it was a way for me to stay in touch with my home culture while I lived abroad. Mm. During the pandemic, I felt myself feeling 
and it was a scary time and it was a scary time even when I stopped, but I felt myself feeling apocalyptic and overwhelmed all the time. Sure. And I logged out of Facebook for two months and it mostly went away. Um, That's great. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, you know, that was such a strange time. We were online all the time. I even thought NFTs were a good idea for about five weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, you That's and a mark on my record. Yeah, you. Yeah, but I mean, it it, it makes it makes some sense. I mean, um, <laughs> uh, I f- oh. not to defend NFT NFT users, but I was also kind of like, well, if you're investing in things right now, and all investments seem like they don't follow the rules of logic for reasons that have to do with complicated financial instruments, quantitative sure. easing, whatever. There's yeah. like, there's like the, the factors are actually so complex that even someone like me who studies this can't tell mm. you what the specific thing yeah. actually is. Well, they they printed several trillion dollars worth of money. In yeah, a, that in too. <laughs> a, in a handful of months, everything was going to go up in in dollar value. Well, yeah, we saw massive asset inflation mm. and it didn't trickle out for a while, but then why how would it because it's not we're really- all inside. I know. <laughs> like, I know. like <sighs> so, you know, I think that led to all kinds of things. Um, yeah. And, and not to turn this into my normal economics podcast. My 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 thing is, though, during that time period, it was very hard. I think because of the social media and because they feel like you feel isolated, so you turn to the computer, but the computer remedies that. And then creates another problem. Yeah, um, yeah, and it remedies it by mostly reinforcing your own prejudices because that's how everything is designed now. Um, everything from a bookmarks bar to a social media algorithm, it's all feeding you back what you wanted in the first place. You're not wandering out into the town square, um, right? So it's uh, you know it's it's very different, and there is something very regulating about in person contact. You know, I went a year without going to the supermarket. My wife and I had a child during the pandemic. We were on the high end of being very uh, careful. And I just remember the first time I went into a store, just the interaction with the cashier kind of was like a a, a level setting thing in terms of personal sanity. Yeah, I think we... I think the isolation took a toll on people in a way that we're going to still be seeing for a long time. Yeah. Um, as a teacher, I pointed this out to uh, my, um, you know, internet buddy, Freddie DeBoer, we were talking about, he was talking about the schools and the learning loss and, mm. and this when the schools were closed. And I, you know, and I, I didn't disagree with him because I, I, I even though I work in internet education now, I, I know how, effective and ineffective at the same time that it is it's effective for some things it's really bad at others mm. there's all kinds of stuff you're teaching that you're that any teacher does that's social that they don't even know they're doing yeah all and, those little cues the approval the disapproval the feeling mm, in the room yeah exactly and um if you're just thrown and said hey put your lessons online it's going to be terrible because what you actually have to figure out how to do is replicate most of those things that you're not even aware that you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And some of them can't be replicated. Some of them can. And then cert- like certain students, I would always say it's great for, but I would never want to replace the, the in-person education system with digital <laughs> education. Yeah. Um, all that though is to say, one of the things that I pointed out to him, and I was like, we also had learning loss in states that opened the schools back up because society <laughs> was messed up and um it was students so you know i know this from other teachers and you know um students when they went back in for the first year we had like no behavior problems at all Hmm. um uh interesting we because the kids didn't even talk to each other they yeah. were just they just sat, they sat there seemingly sail shocked. When I would go into the to the to schools, um they were people, probably socially and 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 sensorially overwhelmed just by having so many people around them. Right. And then the next year, all hell broke loose. Oh, okay. <laughs> like so everything that was bottled up, they were finally able to yeah. Oh yeah. fascinating. We had a, and some of this is really is really sad. Like um 
uh, the first year that everyone's talking about how there was a really low suicidal ideation rate. And, mm. you know, that's the as an argument against, I guess, some conservatives. Well, the next year, our suicidal ideation rate shot through the roof. So oh, that's like, fascinating. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's, it, uh, yeah, like the William yeah. Styron thing, like the real dangerous part of depression is not when you're down in the depths, but when you start to feel better, because that's when right. you finally have the wherewithal to actually do something. Yeah. And I was thinking about all this. And then I was thinking about, you know, I wrote a book of poetry during the pandemic. Um, it was really hard, actually. Mm. It was, I thought it was going to be easy because yeah. I'm like, oh, I have all this time. Um, you know, I have time was to it read. Because it was so hard to imagine an audience for it or. It was hard to imagine an audience for it. It was hard to stay focused because there was sure. nothing else to limit your time. Mm -hmm. Um even, you know, even though I had, you know, I was still working during, during that time period, but it was so unstructured in the first four or five months before oh I figured goodness. out how to do anything. Yeah. I mean, because at first they're just like, go home. We don't know when you're coming back. Oh yeah. You're not coming back this year. Figure yeah. out how to teach your kids online. Have a nice day. <laughs> like yeah. that, it really was that, that, like, oh, no. that it, was it. it. It was the same everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, you're not fired, but don't come here. Yeah, right. Exactly. So it was a very strange time. And, and there's I, the value of time limitation again. Right. And the yeah. value of, 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 of work. So I'd sit down and everything just drug out. Mm. Eventually, I get I started giving myself very artificial deadlines for things. And that's how we got things done. Smart. But yeah. how about you? How was your writing process during the pandemic? And how do you think that changed the novel? How do I think it changed the novel? Well, the thing is that it's a novel that takes place in the near future. Mm -hmm. And when we try to imagine the future, we're always extrapolating from the present. It's what's going on right now, either times something exponential or it's what's going on right now continued out on the same pace at which, you know, it's come into being. Um, and so trying to imagine a future in a place where the present was uh, was offering up so many different futures in so many different ways all the time was sort of challenging. And it was a it, it was a it wasn't a matter of imagining something very different as much as it was trying to imagine what would come out of all this. And it was something that, uh, you know, I don't think that what's come out of this is necessarily that much better. I, you know, out of the pandemic, um, you know, the people who own all the, the money and the companies, they found a way to make it work to their advantage because that's kind of what they do. Um, I don't, so writing during that period in terms of sitting down at the keyboard was difficult because I had a much less structured life. My daughter no longer had uh, school, so I had to kind of find different times to write. Um, my job was wildly different in terms of the hours that it's demanded, the hours my daughter demanded. I had to find different times to write. And then my, you know, and, and I was trying to get it done before my son was born, the first draft. Um, so that was very tricky. And especially I had to do a lot more work at night because my wife was working during the day and I would take my daughter out. We'd go for bike rides, things like that. And then in terms of imagining the future, that was really the hard part. Um, I remember at a time, at that time, I was talking to a friend of mine who's also a novelist. And I said, this year, you can only write historical fiction or science fiction. Um, in a way, I, if I was writing straight literary fiction during the pandemic, I would have been dead in the water because I would be writing for an audience that would not exist. If you're mm -hmm. Jonathan Franzen, you're writing for an audience that lives very much in the world in which you're writing. And a mm -hmm. book takes a minimum of 18 months. I knew the world was not going to be the same in 18 months. So in, in a way, I was very lucky that I wasn't writing literary fiction because you're just dead in the water. And maybe these pandemic novels, quote unquote, that you heard about are going to come out. They're going to be hard to sell. They're going to be hard to read because you sat in your house. You sat in your house. We all sat in our house. How is you sitting in your house better than me sitting in my house? You know? Yeah. I'm, so, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I talk to people I care about who I find very compelling and interesting and exciting people. What do they have to say about the pandemic that's really that exciting? It, uh, I don't know. Like we get in these conversations and we stall out. You know, you know when a conversation just stalls out. 
Um, so writing during that period was hard. Everybody thought like, oh, I'm going to get that novel, you know, written. But it, it didn't work out that way for most people. For me, it did because my book was speculative and I could speculate about the future. And on a second, third draft, I had a little bit of context where I could start to fit in a few more po like I, I had a better idea of what a post pandemic world would look like. But mm -hmm. while I was writing it, not at all. I finished the book in in like June 1st of 2020. So that was the first draft. Sorry, that, that was kind of a rambling answer. No, no, but that's a great answer. And it, it actually gets to I've been thinking about this whole post pandemic thing, too. And I my my answer has been similar to yours. I'm like, if it's going to be interesting, it's going to be science fiction or it's going to be historical fiction about plague years, but not the ones we just lived through because mm. those were boring, really. Um, I mean, or it's going to be analogous. Neither worked in an emergency room. I'm sure, right. you know, but yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I didn't, but I, I have plenty of people around me who worked in healthcare, and yeah, the, it yeah. was crazy, but it was also bizarre and depressing. So you, yeah. we might get some good novels out of that, but yeah. I think for most people... Maybe there's people, a catch-22 from a, a large hospital. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also think maybe this idea that we're going to get a lot of art out of something like this is is maybe fallacious, because I've also been waiting for the Iraq War art, of which there's like two good novels, mm. or the... 9-11 art of which there's one ish good novel and one ish good film mm. i mean it's it's not i don't i often think we what's your good film let me ask about 9-11 <laughs> I, I, I have one that i am a, a staunch champion of so what, what's yours um i i don't think i think the flight the oliver stone movie about 9-11 is not too bad actually but... okay Okay. Which was uh, 25th Hour by Spike Lee. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, I, you know what? It's interesting because it's it's both clearly about 9 11 and yet it's also kind of plausibly deniably. No, not. it's off at a tangent, but it's very much, it, it very much spoke to the moment. Um, it spoke to the moment when it came out, which I think was 2003. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I thought that that movie always affects me. It's actually interesting. And, you know, uh, Spike Lee is one of these filmmakers in this time period, uh, too. Like, I think about Summer of Sam, which is also mm -hmm. tangential, and it's one of his better movies. And probably both these movies are kind of underwatched. Um, oh, I know, I know. And, yeah, Summer of Sam, I've been thinking about that a lot in the last couple of weeks for some reason. It's, it's interesting you bring it up. Um, well, my I mean, daughter yeah. plays softball in a field. That's uh, a block and a half from where he he committed his last murder. So it's just it, it, maybe that's why. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to think about. Um, it's interesting to think about because I also think New York right now um, is not exactly the same as New York in the seventies. While crime rates are higher, they're not that high. Um, yeah. Oh no, no. Yeah. But it does feel like. When I talk to people in bigger cities, I'm I'm in a city, but I'm in Salt Lake, which kind of has its own weird walls, you know. Oh, I've spent some time in Salt Lake City. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a strange town. Yeah, yeah. it's weird, we, but we don't feel like things are gonna bubble over into whatever here. But a lot of people in New York have felt like there's a lot higher tensions and um, and well, whatnot. You know, we spent twenty. 20 at least 10 years in new york just kicking out all the middle income people yeah you, you know <laughs> and so now what you have is you have i don't know i mean you have people who live in these safety depo deposit boxes in the sky and then you have someone who's yelling at ghosts about what happened to their fentanyl you know it's like there's not a lot in between yeah um, that's that's also true for california it's it yeah um I, I uh, have watched the Bay Area with the exception of like East Oakland, which is almost apartheided out of the whole discussion. Mm. Um, uh, just get rid of anything like a middle or lower middle class. It's increasingly upper middle or higher or I'm too poor to leave. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's and and also, you know, it's not bad weather if you're homeless. And so like that's that's what you got mm. and that's kind of a that's a horror story uh you know i've 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 been to places that are like that and and like 
Guatemala City, for example, is like that. Where that, like, I was just going to say, I mean, it, it seems you know when you talk to people from South America, you know, it's 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 rich people living in walled compounds. Yep, and and then everything else in the outskirts, and then like if there's middle class, they live pretty far out. Like, yeah, where the you know where the walled compounds don't have to have such high walls. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but but in you know also in this weird way, if you ever gone to Mexico City, there's like middle class suburbs. Then there is the great slum, mm. and then there's the city. Mm. Um, and a lot of things are like this double donut formation where the inner sure. and outer is inner super rich, outer is is like upper middle class, middle class, and then there's a ring of mm -hmm. like abject poverty. Yeah. Um. And I, yeah, I see, I see New York, uh, the Bay Area, and LA um, from both visiting. I visited Cal. I haven't been to New York in about ten years, but I visited California fairly recently, mm -hmm. and I definitely see that. Like, I see this um, happening, and that, yeah, that would increase tensions, and that would only have gotten worse during COVID because anyone who was middle income at all probably you know if they didn't need to live in the city for work if they were working remotely or whatever now they definitely left oh yeah yeah no, um, you have people in the suburbs uh selling their houses sight unseen for you know a lot of money it's a, a lot of yeah. them came here honestly oh, they, no no it's funny that's why i went to salt lake city I, I came from new york to salt lake city for some business stuff and there's like yeah there's a lot going on in salt lake city business wise now yeah, um, and there's a lot of people, like, it destroyed our housing. Well, it didn't destroy it. It made it, like, as bad as housing inflation is elsewhere, us and Boise, Idaho are the two most inflated markets in the country. Yeah, I'm so, not surprised. Yeah. And, um, and it started, you know, that had been kind of happening with California and tech workers for a long time, but at, over the pandemic, that, like, accelerated. Oh, um, I'm sorry to hear it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, but... If you own a house, you're well for the next few months. You're well off. Um, so, I'm really interested in in the fact that you needed a character to come back from the dead to get all these ideas in here. Yeah, what, yeah. What prompted that? Like, where does where does uh, Tommy Ferroni really come from? And so, yeah, I mean, Tommy Ferroni, a lot of these characters, they're all in middle age and they're mm -hmm. all drifting. You know, they're all, you know, they're, it's like um, you're young, you have ideas, you want to do something, you, you try it out, it works, it doesn't work, whether or not it works, that sets you off on a trajectory. And then um, as you get older, um, you have a little less energy, you have a few more obligations, you have, uh, you're more of a creature of habit, and you kind of continue on these trajectories. And... Uh, originally, when I was trying to figure out this book, I thought it might be literary fiction. It would be these old friends, and they're kind of finding their way through life. And what does America look like now for people who are trying to do these different things? And the book was just, I, I was writing it, but I could feel it dying in my hands as I typed. And, um, and I was like, this is, you know, and I was like, I was just waiting for the next thing to happen. That's what it is sometimes when you work on a book, is you start a book, you have half an idea, you have a good idea, but it's not enough. So you just start and you and you wait, you wait to be saved. And uh, and I had a dream and I had a dream and it saved me. And I said, this is what it needs is it needs for somebody to come. It needs somebody to come back from the dead. And the character who came back from the dead is based very, very loosely. I don't want I don't want anybody to think that this is um, a reflection of a, of, a, of a person I knew, but a very good friend of mine who, who died in 2013. Um, he was a, a very smart guy, a very uh, maladjusted guy. He didn't socially quite fit in. He could never quite find a job, but he, he brilliant in his own way. And he drank. That's the real person. Um, the character that's based on him comes back from the dead and kind of kicks everybody into a different tra trajectory. And, um, and that's, you know, it's just something had to happen. I mean, I guess something has to happen to all of us, but this is what had to happen to these characters. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we all have times in our lives where it seems like these incredibly um, 
uh, unbelievable things happen to us in a very short period of time. And that's really what, what changes us. And that's what makes our lives. So I don't think it's crazy that something that crazy would happen, but it's definitely outrageous that somebody would come back from the dead. Um, so that's kind of where resurrection fit into it was you had these people who were taking care of themselves in their own slipshod way. And, and that's, a, that could be a novel, but I wanted it to be about something else. And this gave me a chance to do that. Yeah. I was, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think, you know, I feel like the book that you're initially describing has a danger of being the kind of book that's often written by 40 year olds, usually baby boomers, honestly, but, um, uh, watch out, man. We're the new baby boomers. Yeah, I know we are. Um, the, uh, the, well, you know, you and I are in that, are in that millennial Gen X, like crossover. Over on zone. Yeah. yeah. Um, Although it's all, I'm still getting used to think of as Gen, people in Gen X, some of them are in their late fifties. Holy crap! Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, I know. Um, but but I, I think what's interesting about this is you get to explore all these tech ideas. You also get to explore religion, new religions, and in re, the relationship of belief that I mm. that I find fascinating um and the you know in a way that i, I kind of only find analogous to like stranger in a strange land, land by Heinlein or something and Heinlein's not an author that i Heinlein's an author i'm highly ambivalent about because his politics are basically the opposite of mine but mm. like yeah um i find that book actually to be massively interesting despite any of Heinlein's politics um and it's it's similar where you know in that case it's a, a a mars colony but where some kind of outsider events ends up sparking basically a new religious and social movement um and i find that those novels tend to somehow be more believable if they're set in the near future and not right now um yeah. um I, I'm not sure why i think it they always work better as near future science fiction but I consistently, because I've, I've read some that uh, Chuck Palahniuk has tried to write some books that kind of do this it, it contemporaneous. Oh, yeah. He plays a lot with ideology and religion and mm -hmm. cults and things like that. Yeah. And and honestly, while some of them are very interesting, a lot of those books are kind of unsatisfying mm. um, and they age really quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, if well, you the go thing is, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go ahead. Much. Okay. People start religions every day. They yeah. start them all the time. Very few of them work out. Um, you know, they get to a certain point and they die out. And when I was a, a young man, when I was a teenager, I went to Catholic school. And mm -hmm. we learned, I can't even believe how much we learned about the early Catholic church, but we learned so much. And it's an incredible time in history. You know, those first uh, 200 AD years are just, are just wild. And you learned about, you know, the suppression of the church and how in a way that was a galvanizing influence, how, you know, the Roman Empire didn't suppress very much at all. You could be bathing in a bull's blood and everything else. And they were just, yeah, that's great. How was your, you know, how was the rest of your weekend? But um, but they really came down on the Catholic Church. And I thought about if you have a spiritual impulse, if you have an inspiration what is it throughout the ages that aligns itself against you? And, you know, you know, for a long time, it was the Catholic Church. You know, you look at the, the, the uh, Albigensian heresy or anything like that. And, you know, these were powerful impulses that were just throttled in the, in the, in the cradle. Um, and I was thinking about what in today's world would really throttle that. And there's, it's, it's this very vague but all-encompassing ideology of, of, uh, of wellness, you know? Like, mm -hmm. what is life for? It's for this thing. It's for this, this idea of, of wellness. Like, like, why would you want to meditate? You'd want to meditate so you can focus and be better at your job to make more money so you have less stress, so you have a sense of wellness, whatever on earth that is. And um, at the time, I worked for a publishing business. It was time. It became Meredith. They had all these magazines about recipes and exercise. It all came up to wellness. 
And I was in meetings about, you know, how these wellness brands can be applied to this business and that business. And um, I don't know, there was just something about it. Like wellness is kind of like happiness, but somehow even more vague and somehow even more expensive. You know, happiness you experience in a moment, wellness you don't experience in any moment. It's spread out over time. It's something that you kind of infer from your general mood after having had the mood. It's a very odd thing. So I said, what would really throttle? What would really destroy a spiritual impulse in today's world? It would be this idea of wellness, which is ultimately what the venture capitalists who take a 49% stake in the religion want to push for. Yeah, I, th- that was such a fast. That's that in and of itself. I'm reminded of a book called Mac, uh, Mac Mindfulness, which talked about the recuperation of uh, like Buddhist soteriological stuff, like meditation, yeah. for wellness, as opposed to what they are originally envisioned for, which has nothing to do with that. Yeah, um, you're going to be a better what marketer for you know Peloton. I mean, come on, right and. I also, what I found interesting about that is, well, wellness is also so vague that it's become, I'm very careful about how I phrase this, but it, it, it's become a, weirdly a point of both D and and also radicalization at the same time in this weird way. Um, it's just vague enough that it can mean anything. It can adopt any of the Ill, any of the complaints you have and and neutralize them it's real you know it's like oh i agree we need more wellness and i'm like no man i need to be paid more money and they're like i understand that you're stressed right now you need more wellness right exactly instead of paying Uh, you more how about if we give you an app on your phone like sorry yeah yeah no i i feel you i'm a teacher um so they're constantly having we we have wellness fridays which i hate Mm. um yeah um, yeah. How about just Pizza Fridays? I mean, man, come on, let's not kid ourselves. You're not making me better. You're you're an idiot, right? Like, like throwing throwing some pop psychology at me and sending me to a training where you have a non psychologist break down another non psychologist's views of a psychological concept is probably not yeah. going to really help anybody. Um, yeah. You know, and it also isn't working because we're losing teachers faster than we ever have. Um, it, so it's, you know, we've been losing teachers for pretty, pretty well for, tw- for 15, 20 years. Yeah. Um, the, I find, you know, the hostility your book has towards that and the like satirical element of that was refreshing to me because it's something I think a lot about. But I also think about, you know, you're right. The vagaries of that, it can be used as corporate nullifying talk. It's also so vague that I've noticed that it opens people up to things like really bizarre conspiracy theories. Like you have the whole like hippie to QAnon pathway and almost all of it goes straight through the wellness pipeline. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's it's wild, Um, you know, because happiness is vague. And you're right. Happiness is vague enough, actually. But at least you can say, at least, I, oh, I'm happy right now. Oh, yeah. hey, you know, but, you know, I was happy and then I'm not happy. But wellness is like this. It's like what? It's like a decade long. What? It's like a journey. And then there's the journey to wellness and uh, recovering wellness. It's like, what the fuck is wellness? Right. It, it's it's a super vague concept that you can pretty much use to do anything. And I do think. So I've been, you know, uh, one of my one of my subjects of interest is the anthropology of religion and philosophy, which is like, you know, kind of high end, but it's, it's something that I, that I studied in undergrad kind of gave up because, uh, doesn't pay well. <laughs> Not that many people specialize in that. Yeah. Um, um, but, um, I, I keep up with it. And one of the things that I've noticed about, this is a lot of people thought America would resist the secularization trend. Um, It, it did for a long time until about the aughts actually, then it's, it's caught up to Europe pretty fast. Hasn't completely caught up to it. No, wait, when you say the secularization trend, what do you mean? So this is where, this is where it gets complicated. So secularization claim is the increasing number of people who don't identify as religious. Oh, Um, Okay. And I don't even necessarily, they're not like militant atheists or anything. They just, yeah, like, they're just indifferent. Right. And even, among, but what, I, what I've what i noticed is this wellness stuff 
Oh, it sweeps them up. It sweeps them up, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you have all these people who will identify as Christian, but you go look at the church attendance records. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, no, none of y'all are going to church. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking about all these like, like psychological health wellness gurus that, that have bizarre politics. Um, I think the most famous one is Jordan Peterson, but there's a lot of these mm. guys mm. and they will, you know, they kind of have a stick, right? They, they'll throw out uh, a vague platitude. They'll do a, they'll do a psychological reading of, of like the Bible and, and not a plain text reading, not a theological reading. And then they'll throw out another platitude and then they'll make some grand statement and it'll really have some kind of political valiance that they're not to- totally articulating. This is Ooh. like a genre now. Um, yeah. But it, it, it all sneaks in under this wellness category. Well, in a way. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. And also, but at the same time, I think people have very strong, human beings have very strong religious impulses. And, and when they move away from religion, they apply those impulses elsewhere. Also agreed. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I feel like we see this in a lot of areas, areas that we wouldn't expect. Um, I just... Uh, a lot of people's politics substitutes for their religion too. Honestly. Absolutely. Oh, I see that every day. Yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, but it's, it, it's hard to get away from. It's hard. It, it's a way that we're structured. It's a way that our intellects and our emotions intersect. You know, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if you ever got into Robert Sapolsky. Um, the uh, he's, he's, a, he's a neurobiologist and um, he studied not gorillas. He, uh, he studied primates for years and then he came back and he got a second degree in, in the structure of the human brain. And he really talks about how the way that we think is it, at best, it's an amalgam. It's an amalgam of our impulses. It's an amalgam of how the, our, the back of our brains work with the front of our brains. Um, the, you know, when we see things, how we react to them is very much in, in our hypothalamus in you know, in our fear centers. And then our frontal cortex interprets has like a second bite at the apple with what we actually see, but is also responding equally to what we, re- how we react to it. And um, I mean, it, it, it's fascinating stuff, but the truth is what we, even what we experience is not totally reliable. And, that's very true in how we formulate our opinions and how we understand the world. Um, and why does an idea appeal to you? Why does an idea appeal to me? You know, it's, it, it, if we're really honest with ourselves, we really want to go into something that we hold to be a home truth or something that's a, a, an, an item of hope in our own minds. The, the genealogy of that is, is a lot dirtier than we like to admit. Hmm. Yeah. That sounds like a, uh... Uh, so luck like Robert Wright too, who writes a lot about. Oh this yeah, kind of thing. yeah. Um, sure, and I think uh, I think you're right. I what what I find interesting about about the secularization thesis is all the people who proposed it in the beginning in the in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it looked like it wasn't happening in America for a long. And now worldwide, it's not happening. Religion's actually growing. It's just mm. it's it's in the developed core where religious impulses i think are getting put in other areas and religion also if i get really technical it's a very vague concept but um sure sure but uh you know i think i i i would go so far as to say that uh secularism is in fact a bit religious well it is also a concept that only makes sense if you have a religious framework like if you try to talk about secular world and like ancient rome it doesn't really make any sense you're imposing that concept it's actually like yeah trying to impose our concept of race on the ancient world too it doesn't work like they don't think that way yeah um yeah the roman secular world was really just the roman religious world yeah i mean you know um basically i guess that would be stuff that isn't mystery cults but there's no real distinction other than that like was a cult yeah (laughs) um so it's i think that um you know I, I think one of the the ironies of the secularization is that people who think it leads to scientific thinking um, are more rational thinking, whatever they mean by rational too. And you mean a lot of things by that. Yeah. But um, 
I think they're basically just wrong. <laughs> like, like, there's no way. Well, scientific thinking and rational thinking are active disciplines that you apply to things. I mean, you know, right? You actually go out and examine physical evidence. People don't do that. They just say, "Well, I'm a rational person because, I, because they can say it. Because anyone can say it." Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. um, at best, you might get people who can employ like predicate logic to win an online argument, but that's not even really, yeah, you're yeah. right. That's not the same thing as being a rigorous thinker. Um, and I, I, I think also people compartmentalize even people who theoretically know better in such a way that it's almost impossible not to, for the reasons that we're talking about, like your brain, you process things physically. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you take that that physical like limbic vein processing stuff and you also put it in a social context that you're also not in control over and which, you know, changes but can change things radically. Um, it is it is interesting, for example, a person who lived in, in, in three very different societies that are all still, you know, vaguely speaking, capitalist and this and the other. Mm. Um, the things that don't change, but then the things that do um like just the way you read intentions change and this that you know so i always say that because uh there's you know on the left there's a stupid debate about human nature or whatnot and i don't i i mostly deal with a leftist audience mm -hmm. and i'm always saying like yeah the, i think there is probably because of human biology because of, because of primate conditioning there probably is something like human nature but it always is being interacted with by stuff outside of it in ways that are going to make different parts of it come out at different times. Oh, sure. And so it's not entirely predictable what any one person's going to do. But then like when we're like, there's a reason why it averages all, out over time. Right. right. Yeah. And there's a reason why like almost all societies have some set of presuppositional beliefs that look like religion um, regardless, like I can't think of a society, even societies don't have a concept of an afterlife or so it might not have Ooh. something that's part of our religious framework. But, but all like, societies have a sense of watch the fuck out for human nature. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like that thing that you think is the right thing to do is maybe not like, yeah, like check yourself. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and most societies also have something like dualism. I mean, like, sure. like, um, like there's like the you that exists in your brain that's operational versus the you that's not. I mean, there are societies that deliberately try to get around that. I think of Buddhism is explicit about that. Mm -hmm. But um, and, you know, uh, I still, however, don't know a single Buddhist who doesn't use I. What is like, I? Oh, yeah. When they talk about themselves, yeah, right. Like, like they still yeah. talk about themselves in the first person, even if, even if, um, even if they have dissolved into the greater self, right? Yeah, yeah. right. And, yeah. and you know, the whole, the whole I is an illusion. Yeah, it's true, but you, you can't communicate without it. Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so these impulses, I think, lead to the cluster of things we call religion. And I, I don't think, I don't think a more secular society gets rid of them. I don't think you end up in a like a perfectly rational scientific world. And I think, no, I know, think the same, you know, a, a very similar set of impulses and prejudices reemerge, but without a tradition that can kind of handle them. Right. Well, um, you know, you know, we're, we're talking art today, but I think this is related because this, this whole empathy digital pain thing that you're talking about um, plays on things that are often traditionally controlled and channeled within religious traditions. Yeah. And um, now even in Rose religious traditions are kind of not anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, now what we're seeing, and, and, and this is a big part of the book is the, you know, like if you play a video game, you walk around and you shoot people and you just shoot them and you shoot them. Bah, 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 bah. And the thing that the game was supposed to do was to show you that like, actually when you shoot somebody, it's, it's really horrible. It's really mm -hmm. horrible to inflict pain on another person. And if you've ever inflicted physical, like real physical pain on someone, it's, it's awful. It's, I mean, unless you're a sociopath, but if you're a real person and that person is, even if you don't like that person, it's, ter I don't know if you've ever been in many like fist fights or anything like that. It's awful. It's emotionally, yep. uh, it's, it's, it's miserable. 
And you watch these movies where people are kicking the crap out of each other, shooting each other, then video games where you are actually the one shooting people. So the idea of this game was that you would experience the pain that that person went through. And, and somehow that would, you know, that was what made this video game into a piece of art. But pretty quickly, what the people with the money figured out was that empathy is a way to manipulate people. Mm -hmm. And that's the real, you know, that's the real value in it. It's not to make people come to terms with their own agency and their ability to impact other sentient beings on the world. But actually, it's to make them feel pain that's relatively unrelated to them in a way that will make them do something. And, um, and, and that's sort of when the book turns a little bit dark. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think, you know, I, I, I think not only is it where the book turns a little bit dark, I think that's like the key psychological insight of the book that I find interesting um, yeah. and very, and very fruitful. Um it's also we we live in a world where all of the best impulses we have tend to be turned against us, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and and how do you deal with that? You know, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, community making is turned against you. Oh, um, when I hear the uh, word community, I just make sure I still have my wallet. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> right. Um, you, you think about. You know, I mean, it it, it kind of started with the obvious ones, which was sex and death. But then it's like grown to almost any human, um, any human impulse can be used to at first commodify, and then people who play off the commodification can learn through other manipulations with it. And you know, that's you know, in some ways it's always been true, but it it, it literally is a science now. Like, mm. well, that's the thing, yeah, <laughs> is that it happens a lot faster than before, right? And a lot more precisely than before, like, yeah, and yeah, yeah. All the worst people have gotten way better at their jobs, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's that's 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 the case, yeah. Um, <laughs> and and so I was very interesting to see, um, that your model went there. How's this, how's this novel being received so far? Well, it's, you know, it, 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 it hasn't come out yet. It comes out in uh, six weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's gotten pretty good reviews um, from the early, you know, the early reviewers. If anybody who's listening is a reviewer, I can get you a, 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 an advanced copy. Um, so it, it's been pretty well reviewed. It's, uh, I guess we'll see. We'll see. You know, I, it's going to, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um... And if you anybody wants to pre-order it, it's on Amazon. It's you can order it from a local bookstore. It's uh, it's available everywhere. So let's see, and I will put all the links in the show notes because um, this will probably be coming out in a few weeks. So yep. it'll be a little bit closer to this. Let's see. Um, I'm looking at it online right now. Um, so. September 20th is the is the launch date and that's for the audiobook for the ebook for the paperback so so yep yeah. and let's see here um do you do so you decided to publish this one um direct yourself I did I did I mean I've done this before I've I've uh, I've directly published self published whatever you want to call it um six or seven other novels and I've, <clears throat> I, I've had a really good time with it. Um, I haven't gotten rich, but I've, I've reached a lot of readers. And I've gotten a lot of good reviews and I've had, you know, complete control, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm putting this out myself. I did, I tried for a few agents, but it, it just, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't like to think I waste a lot of time in my life, but the times that I spend querying agents, I will count among wasted times. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I was going to ask you, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is people used to ask me if they should self-publish or not. And I mm. used to tell them no. Yeah. Um, I no longer do that. Um, and part of that is because, um, one, you know, I, I work with, I personally work with a lot of very, very small presses. Um mm -hmm. Um, and right now I can tell you that 
as far as book as far as uh, book distribution goes, Amazon treats them all pretty equally, and uh, Barnes and Noble isn't stocking these things from a publisher either. Yep. Um, so it it's not that big a deal, um, and that increasingly a lot of people um, are just handling handling it themselves. Um, but it is hard to market with a oh self published push. Well, yeah, because there's so much. I mean, because they're, you know, Amazon doesn't really have quality control. Um, so, yeah. um, how how is how is getting this stuff out? I mean, you you get you get pretty decent reviews, and yep. you have a you know, you have a pretty established pipeline of people you work with. But how's pushing this stuff out now as an independent writer? It's hard, and it's an uphill battle, and it's scary. And I think this is one thing that, um, you know, a lot more people self-publish now. And, you know, the temptation is to say that the, um, the stigma is gone. The stigma is not gone. The stigma is yours to overcome. You know, we live in a world of digital media in many forms. Um, mm -hmm. And it's yours to dive into as you wish. But you know what you're not doing um, is, is you have no safety net if you fail. If you put out a book with Random House and you fail, you say Random House published my book and you at least have that like, you know, that that little safety net. Random House thought it was good. You're going out onto the beach with no air cover. Um, everything will be counted against you. Every typo, every mistake, everything that you get wrong in a way that it really wouldn't be counted against you if it was a Random House book. Right. Um, it would just be put down to the fact they're getting cheap with their editors. Like... Cheap with the editors. Yeah, exactly. And, and I spot typos in those books all the time. But the thing is that you really are going out on your own. And the only way to succeed is to succeed. With a book by Random House, you can succeed even while you don't sell any books. Um, so you have to be very confident. You have to believe in the book. You have to believe in what you believed in while you wrote it. And you have to believe that you did a good job making it into what you wanted to make it into. Um, and ultimately, that's asking a lot of people. And that's asking a ton of people who have gone through any kind of a workshop system or an MFA where everything is based on kind of the collective coming together and saying, we validate what you said. And um, so that, I mean, that's really, really hard. Um, and in terms of the production stuff, the production stuff you can figure out. Mm -hmm. Look at a book you like. How does it look? What does the cover look like? Can you figure that out? No. Can you hire somebody who can? Probably. What does the interior look like? Can you figure it out? Maybe not. You can hire somebody who does that too. So the production stuff you can figure out. The marketing stuff is the next step. Marketing, let me be honest with you, Penguin Random House hasn't figured out marketing. You no. talk to people who have been published by those guys, they leave you out to dangle, you know? It's, um, you know, they're, <clears throat> they're putting money down at the roulette table. And if your number doesn't hit, it's just like, well, we'll try again next year with somebody else. And when you come back and say, I have a book next year, they say, oh, your book failed. So we're not going to do you again. Yeah, um, I so have known more than one person, actually, yeah. um, from from Random House or Tour who got a good name. Like, and I'm not trying to knock them in particular, but they are kind of the big one. Well, you know? I about to say, yeah. like, they're now the big one if this yeah. if this – Consolidation so I, goes through. I don't know almost... anything special about them in particular. It's the same at St. Martin's. It's the same at wherever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I think about a lot of, you know, I have several several friends who went up through the small publishing, get their first tour book, get get in advance. Mm. Um, it's marketed poorly or they, or they don't know how to market it. Um, and then they are pretty much out to dry. I mean, a lot of, some of them say writers, uh, they become editors, mm. but you know, they don't release with a major press ever again off of one book that was just most of the time generally not marketed well. Um, and well, often in all fairness though, nobody knows how to market books. There right. People, well, I mean, nobody does. It's not like, it's not like if we got the five greatest marketers together, and they and we said market this book that it would be a huge success. It's you know it's a crapshoot. It's you know, it's people get lucky and then get a reputation for being good. You know, and maybe they're smart. Sometimes they are. A lot of times they're not. 
you just like it, it's it you can't really knock them from marketing it poorly they probably know that they don't know how to market these this stuff because nobody does oh well i think and their stuff there's stuff about it also to defend them the stuff about the book industry that goes back to book practices around world war ii that literally don't make sense um mm. like oh my god the consignment novel i mean the, yeah. the consignment model is insane yeah, yeah. The, the consignment model is is utterly nuts and mm. um and it's very easy for because of that and because of these distribution channels for someone to lose a ton of money on a book um it's the truth. Uh, um, whereas if you do it yourself, you can lose some money on a book. I mean, if you pay a copy editor and a good graphic designer to help you out, like mm. you can you can be out a not insignificant chunk of change, but it's not on the level of yeah. um, you know, what what some of those places can do. And and yeah, I also think like Editing's an art, and in some ways, you know, there's also truth to the to the saying that like uh, an editor, if if they're known, will take the failure, but they're almost never going to get the credit. The credit's going to go to the author, and that's true. Uh, mm. I've been an editor, I know how it goes. Um, all that said, um, I also like you think no one really knows how it works. No one really understands it. Like, how does something like Twilight or Fifty Shades of Grey um, become you people know. just like it. You don't know. Yeah. You never know. And you don't know why. Like. Yeah. I mean, every year, big <laughs> publishers shell out millions of dollars on an advance for a book that goes nowhere. And then, you know, these tiny little books just take over the world. And it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. You I don't see. know. I mean, yeah. it, it's it that part of it. I think I'm highly sympathetic towards them on because it's. I it, guess the, what I would say to authors, though, about the, the problem with big publishers or the idea that success is when you get in with a, a giant publishing house is that it it inculcates a learned helplessness mm -hmm. where you are not the arbiter of what your best work is you are not the arbiter of what you think your audience wants to read um and you get people who start writing toward agents people who start writing toward uh editors and then what you, what do you have? Well, you know what you have? You have a thousand YA werewolf novels. That's what you have. Okay. Which nobody wants as far as mm -hmm. I can tell. And you just get a sea of garbage because it becomes a feedback loop of writers writing for agents, agents, you know, it's just people selling to each other. And, yeah. and ultimately you end up with a culture industry that leaves everyone shrugging their shoulders. And, oh yeah. And feeling, yeah. And feeling like, we live in a civilization that doesn't deliver the goods. I mean, that is something I think is very interesting to think about. And the commodification uh, uh, of art is, is relevant to that. Not that I think all commercial art is bad. Look, I'll go out on the limb and defend Stephen King. But, sure. well, but you Stephen know. King, I mean, he seems like an industry, but he's, a, he's just a lone weirdo up in Maine. Right. I mean, you know, he, he, he was commercialized, but he's not an industry. I mean, but it's it's a weird thing to. I mean, he's also a person who I think was rewarded for his success and then punished for his success for a long time, and we've gone back to being okay with admitting we like him. Well, um, yeah, but when he was punished, they didn't make him give back the money. I mean, that's true. You know, no. I, so <laughs> I, um, the the interesting thing about that for me is is I think we can think about this in terms of the authors and they're, they're not yet. Now, when we talk about stuff like, like uh, Ulysses are like, I don't know, um, the wasteland. I, you know, one of the things I tell people, some of that stuff was self-published. I know. Walt Whitman <laughs> was self-published. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche was self-published. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, so I'm like, I, you know, I've always been, be careful what you knock. I, I admit when you're dealing in the self-published realm, you do as a reader have mm. to do a lot more due diligence um, to get a product because it is, it, it is, it is really, you are really taking ownership um, of what you're reading directly. And you're taking more of a chance. Absolutely. And you're taking way more of a chance. Um, yeah. But it's also like with indie movies, which is another thing. Um, it's similar now because people can make their own. It's really cheap to do now. We yeah. talked about how there hasn't been the great iPhone movie. You go into any movies. Yeah. 
90% of it's crap, but yeah. a lot of the better stuff still comes out of that because sure. the constraints aren't there. Yeah. I mean, um, and unfortunately right now we, we, we tend to then, you know, grab those people, they get to make one good movie and we throw them in like, they have to make the, the Thor. Yeah. Yeah. They get, whatever. we throw them yeah. into the Disney pipeline and then it's pretty much death for, for any originality over time. Cause there's a house style. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of coming back to that model. The thing is literature can't work on that model. I've never, I can't imagine uh, house style books. Like well, you have James Patterson. That's true. Um, I guess. I, I guess. I, I, I guess you're right. There, that you could probably do that. What? Yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, uh, who's going to turn down the money? You know, that's what I want to see. You know, is 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 we live right now in the consequences of nobody turning down the money for quite a while. Yeah, and I. Uh... It's hard to turn down money. When's the last time you turned down money? Where somebody uh, offered you money. And you about a year ago, but it's okay. hard. Uh, yeah, it's hard. I, no, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I walked away from. I walked away from a, from a, from a gig that I pretty much guaranteed I had. Um, be, uh, be, for, for ethical and creative reasons. But you know what? I've only done it once. Mm. Um, and if I was not also a high school teacher, it would have been even harder to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it, it's tough, man. And it's not you talk about a house style. A house style is enforced by a bunch of people who don't want to lose their jobs. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I think getting mad at the artist for this is kind of beside the point. Right. Like, mm. but someone's got to I do think right now and I, I'm I, I'm kind of making a pitch to my audience to 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 be willing to read more of this this self-published stuff because there has been sure. a lot of good stuff come out of it. Even the stuff that's been like broadly recognized as good. Um, well, you know, gosh, if I can just, you know, continue to be slightly controversial here. Um, I think that the real, you almost have no choice. Mm -hmm. I, I have a really hard time with published stuff. They, um, the financial pressures on these publishers now are so high and the experience level among the editors are so low because the editors are so poorly paid that they have to basically flee the industry, you know, the moment they have a kid or anything like that. Right. I mean, um, yeah. that, that basically what comes out now is very shallow. The not, you know, the nonfiction is, is basically what was on NPR 18 months ago made into a book very rapidly and very poorly. And the fiction just follows very broad trend lines, um, which, you know, which consists of either chasing a commercial trend or showing that you're enlightened enough that you can't be fired. So it's like, it's um, when I go into a regular bookstore and I hate to knock regular bookstores, but you know, especially a small independent book bookstore that can only stock things for a little while. And that has a 90 day window on what they can hold because of the consignment sales. Like I'm very underwhelmed. And when I get excited about a bookstore, it's, you know what? It's a used bookstore. Yeah, me too. And oh, because you get weird stuff from weird publishers, people died in their houses and the books came over and you find things that are just so far outside of what you understand or what you know. And it's also cheap enough that you can take a lot of chances. Um, I don't know, man. So in terms of my pitch for self-published books is like, when you buy a book with, you know, the big, you know, Viking name on it, you kind of know what you're getting. If you've been reading, if you're an adult who's been reading for 10 or 15 years, you know what you're getting. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and frankly, I find that tragic. I find that horrifying that you would only read something that you are where you already know what you're getting. I, I, I would say basically what you're doing is putting a fresh layer of lacquer on the inside of your own coffin. I think people need to hear that too. And this is even true for, for things other than books, but I think in books it's it, right now, unfortunately it's extremely true. I can walk in and unless you were established before say 1980 and, um, and even some of those people, uh, you know, one of my favorite authors, uh, Gene Wolfe, I, I, you know, uh, he, he's had books out recently 
I can't find them in in a new bookshop mm. generally at all. I, I can get yeah. them on Amazon, and I can I can find them in used stores all the time. But like you know, he's he's uh, he's too hard to figure out where he goes on the shelves. Mm. Um, he's 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 a genre writer who's difficult. You know, mm. he, he has he has literary aspirations mm-hmm. and it frustrates a lot of readers. And so he's hard to stop. And there, I can think of example after example of this. There are counter examples and yeah, there are plenty of, but you're right. I, I can also think of the NPR phenomenon where I can predict, and this has been, a, this has been truer and truer for the past decade. Oh my like, God. You talk about a monoculture. Yeah. Yeah. Like what, what, what the nonfiction is, what the fiction's going to be. If it's not pop, pop YA fiction which is mm. most of it and then it's almost a relief to get a weird academic book in one of these stories, uh, which exactly is, like, yeah like like it's like oh well the, like this is by Yale so it's gonna it, it, it might be different um whereas I go into you know and, and we have some good ones here in Salt Lake we used to have a massive one you go into mm. something like uh there's this old place called Eburn's and I went to I, one in Salt Lake City that was downtown, and it had like old Time magazines in it. Yep, that's that's okay. Eburns actually. It's probably oh. Eburns or uh, there's another one too. Both of whom you might be finding. I found a Nick Tosh's book that I never knew came out. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, I found. Yeah, I found. I found a couple of poets books that I swear they're not listed in their bibliography anywhere. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that place yeah. is awesome. I know exactly the place. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's what I tell people to do now. But you know, Amazon is evil, but it's also the great equalizer scenario. No, I know. <laughs> um, uh, it's because you know, so I, I work with a lot well, of micro publishers. One of them is basically only a step away from being self published because they they use Amazon printing services now. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, it's like no, almost no difference. You'd be surprised. I mean, I, I buy reputable books that when you go to the back and you look at the barcode, it's you're like, oh, this was published by Amazon Self Printing Services. Yeah. Yep. Um, and- yeah. But what I would say is, you know, look the book up and then order it through your local bookstore. Because even if, if, for all of my complaints about small indie bookstores and, you know, the pressures they're under and how it limits you, you don't want to be in a place without a bookstore. No, you don't even want to be in a place where the only where only options are Amazon and like one Barnes and Noble's mega store that's mostly games. Yeah, like. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. That's what I do with the bookstore near me is I find something weird and then I order it through them. And uh, I don't know. I, I'm so happy every time I walk past there, I'm happy. It just cheers me up a little bit. So. People should check out your book. It will. It, you can pre-order it. It's going to be available on e-readers too. If you can pre-order it, pre-order it through a local bookstore. If you have, to, if you don't have one, uh, I'm Go pretty for sure Amazon. It's fine, man. It's fine. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Um, you'll get something for it either way. <laughs> um, yeah. Probably. Uh, so, so um, check out the book. Um, so the book it, comes out September twentieth. If you order it between now and then and you find me on social media or wherever and you let me know, I will mail you 25 of these really cool stickers. Okay. So that's what I got. Awesome. That's my um, slap chop moment. Yeah. And uh, I would I would say also check out your poetry. I really like it. I published it. Um, I know. I know. Thanks um, again for that. And uh, I I think that I think people check out that book. We haven't talked about it, but I think it's pretty great. Oh yeah, uh, you have it unbuilt. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you have oh, what, two other novels, three other novels. What, what else have you got that's available? I have um, so I have six novels or seven other novels. Um, you can find them all on my Amazon page or on my uh, my website thecollindods.com. Um, they range from science fiction to thrillers, um, to supernatural thrillers, to literary fiction. Um, I also completed, uh, I mentioned a book of aphorisms called Forget This Good Thing I Just Said, which is available as an app for the iPhone. All the aphorisms are connected to a random number generator uh, that make it function a little bit like the I Ching in terms of 
bringing in synchronicity and chance with literature. Um, so yeah, a, a, any of those are, are great. Awesome sauce. All right. Well, um, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put those links in the show notes. I also put links to the uh, essay that um, I referred there. Oh yeah, and, that'd be great. Uh, I think there's also uh, I think you sent me two pre-published chapters, so we can put those. If you can taste yeah. before you buy um, some excerpts. Yeah. Yep. And uh, thank you, Colin. And thank you uh, so much. This was wonderful. Yep. Um, hopefully. This will help get some more independent literature out there into the world. And thank you for talking about the general state of being an artist right now. Cause I'm, <laughs> I, I actually don't, I it weirdly, um, we live in a time where I feel like this is actually not being discussed that much for once. And maybe I just quit Ooh. listening to the places to discuss it, but I don't feel like it is like, yeah. Um, so um, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Same to you. All right. Bye.